Hey guys, Quiv, the Lazy Geek here. And today I want to talk about processing. And I'm gonna process basically one of the targets that I've been aiming at in recent nights and that you've seen in some of my videos, which is uh, the Needle Galaxy. And to do that, I'm gonna use PixInsight. And this is going to be a lazy person's guide to processing because I am lazy. I don't like to use a lot of time on processing. And that means that if there's a process that will increase my or improve my image by like 5% or 10%, but it takes me five hours to do, I typically will not do it. Um, so my workflow stays fairly simple and fairly straightforward despite being in a white zone. So first things first, um, we had, I had three nights of imaging on the Needle Galaxy using Nina and my imaging PC and scope that are upstairs, two floors above, above me right now. And um, the, the images were synced automatically to my processing PC here. Uh, if you're interested in how to sync between an imaging PC and a desktop PC that's going to be your processing PC without having to use like USB hard drives or um, network drives, that kind of stuff. I have a video on that and uh, I should be displaying it on the screen right now. Um, otherwise, we can look at uh, the light frames that I got. So these are the light frames that I got across those uh, three nights. I have 1,562 frames uh, that I've taken, each uh, 30 seconds long. And the first thing that I want to do with those uh, light frames is to actually calibrate them using uh, dark flat frames and flat frames. Uh, among those two, the super important ones are flat frames because they correct for optical um, defects or for unflatness of your optical um, imaging train. It's absolutely critical to have good flat frames and I think I'll make a video later on about how I take my uh, flat frames because I've gone through quite a few methods and I finally have a good flat panel uh, that I can use reliably and that works really, really well. Um, and on top of the flat frames, I use dark frames uh, and I have two sets of dark frames. I have one set of dark frames for my 30 seconds uh, main exposures and then I have one set for my flat frames which I try to take within 1.5 seconds. One of the things I do not do is bias frames because bias frames, I've heard and read a lot that they should not be done with CMOS sensors. And instead I take, because my sensor is cool, that I can take dark frames all day long when it's cloudy or, or all night long where, when it's cloudy. And so I take like 100 frames for a single master dark or 200 frames for a single master dark flat. And that way my dark frames include the bias signal and with that I just don't need to use bias frames. And that's much easier that way. And I just short circuit the debate about whether you should use bias frames for CMOS sensors. Okay, so how I do my calibration, I could use the image calibration tool in PixInsight. I'm typically too lazy, I prefer to simply use the weighted batch pre-processing uh, because it will simply, which is under uh, script, and uh, I cannot open it right now because it's a modal window, but you'll find it under script and batch processing. Um, it's great because it will do both the calibration and the debayering uh, in one go, that way I don't need to come back to my computer, uh, manually do the debearing and launch the debearing process and then come back again once it's done. Uh, it could also perform the registration on the fly and the integration on the fly and it typically works pretty well, but the weighted criteria that it uses uh, are not for me uh, because I'm going to use very specific weighted criteria and the reason is because I have 1,500 something frames, I don't have the time to go through them with the blink tool. And also the blink tool in PixInsight, which lets you quickly look through the frames that you've taken, it's sometimes very difficult to know how the sky quality is, especially when you get lower on the horizon, when you're in a light polluted area like Tokyo here, um, the smog is not that easy to perceive when you're using just the blink tool. And, but you would want to kind of remove the most affected images. Um, also, there's things like thin layers of clouds, there's star, like poor tracking, wind, that kind of stuff that can be hard to find when you're looking through, droning through uh, over a thousand exposures, over a thousand five hundred exposures. So I use automated methods for that using the subframe selector, but I do not use the same criteria as is usually recommended. And so I'll get that uh, as well. 
Okay, so we have um, our frame. So uh, you just, I just need to have uh, CFA images selected here simply because uh, my images are from an OSC camera. And I also checked that I want to use a master dark and use a master flat. And the reason is that I have already prepared this master dark and master flats in uh, pre with previous targets. I created those maybe like one month ago and I haven't touched my imaging train since then. So I don't have any need to recreate them. So you can see that if I go into flats, I've actually uh, added um, a flat which is from this folder. You can see I have my master flat here and I have a, a master dark of uh, 30 seconds that I added here. And that's pretty much it, right? And then I can uh, select my uh, needle processing directory and just run this. It's gonna take a while. So I've actually done that before the video. Yes, I cheated. And um, if we want to look at uh, the results, uh, we have, uh, if I look at my needle processing uh, folder, I have the debayered frames here, a total of 1,562 frames as expected that have been debayered, and I can open any one of those. So I can uh, close this, close this, and I'll just double check that it looks kind of decent. And yes, I see a galaxy. That's probably not one of my best frames. I might want to reject it or to weigh it much lower on uh, on the scale because the, the galaxy is barely visible. Um, this one, let's have a look. It's a bit better. I can actually see kind of the streak through the, through the core of the galaxy. You can see there's quite a bit of variance between my frames and I need a way to weigh them properly and to reject the ones that I don't like. Uh, fairly easily. So to do that, I'm going to use the subframe selector, um, which is here. It used to be a script. It's no longer a script. And to use it, first we're going to measure uh, the frames. And measuring the frames, it's simply you have the main screen here. The action is measure subframes here. And I'm going to add my files. So I'm going to go to my Nina needle, needle processing my debayered frames, I'm going to select everything because I want to measure everything. And um, ideally, I should put my subframe scale, but it so happens that it is actually around one arc, arc second per pixel. So I'm good. And the camera gain, uh, which is relevant for some of the statistics, but none of the statistics that I actually use, so I don't care, I don't put it in. I'll just put the camera resolution in um, as 16 bits, even though the actual camera is either 12 or 14 bits, I don't even remember. Uh, those results are presented as 16 bits when I record it uh, and, and you know, sent to Nina. And uh, arc seconds, electrons, local midnight sites. Uh, I, I, I don't even know what those are used for. So I'm just gonna like kind of ignore, uh, ignore all of that. Although, well, since we're here, I can say that yes, in UTC, my local site midnight is actually at 15 UTC. Uh, we're also at solar time here in Japan, which means the sun rises super early and sets uh, also super early, which can be very annoying. Um, but okay, so now we are, we have this. I'm not gonna touch any of the other like settings, I think it's gonna work uh, well enough. And I'm just gonna cl create, uh, click on the apply global button there and it's gonna measure uh, my frames. And I have not done that prior to, vid to the video, so this is gonna take a while. And so I'll be back once it is done, so see you then. And here it is done, uh, the frames have been measured and we can see the results that we have here in the subframe selector. And the subframe selector can be, um, yeah, it can it shows immediately that I'm having some issues, right? So if we look at the full width half measure, which is a an indicator of how tight, so how well in focus and how good the seeing was for the stars in the image, I can see I have a lot of variance, uh, and I'll probably want to throw away frames that are above maybe 5.5 or 6. Um, completely and then maybe weigh others. I have another uh, criteria that we can use which is eccentricity. Uh, the, the more the stars are kind of uh, oblong in shape, 
we want to reject that. And uh, I can see I have a bunch of those here, so uh, which could be caused by wind or poor tracking at the time. And another one that I'll use to reject bad frames is the number of stars. And this is very interesting because we can see that regularly I'm getting fewer and fewer stars. Um, and it's very, I know why actually, you get it once per session, it's super visible and it's because we're getting lower and lower close to the horizon. If I was in a dark area, there would be no problem, but I'm in, uh, I'm in Tokyo. So mm, uh, the closer we are to the horizon, the more into the smog uh, we are, the desolation of smog. And uh, and so the number of stars that are in there are get lower and go, get lower. And actually, the main criteria that I will I will use for uh, waiting and for um, selecting of my frames will be the number of stars. Simply because I want to. Uh, it, it's a very good indicator because you'll get fewer stars when you get into the smog you'll get fewer stars when you have high clouds passing through. You'll get fewer stars when you have poor tracking because these smaller stars will not get detected by the routine anymore. And I find it much better than using SNR. So there is an, a signal to noise ratio uh, measure. I guess it's, uh, it's uh, the SNR weight of this that uh, I, I honestly don't like using because it seems that it, f it likes to actually, it thinks that stars, that exposures with higher level of clouds or smog have uh, a, a better SNR. Or so I think, maybe I'm completely wrong, in which case, please correct me in the comments. But basically I'm gonna use the stars as my main, main indicator. And basically, I mean, first things first, I think I want to completely ignore any exposures that has fewer than 50 stars. Right, so I go into my approval here, and I'm going to say that uh, one uh, approval um, criteria is that I want to have at least 50 stars. And then I click on uh, play here, or whatever this button is, to execute that. It will uh, look at the number of stars for each of the frames. There's 1,500 frames to go through, so it is a bit in a pain. And pa, you can see that immediately we're losing a lot of exposures. Um, I've already like, yeah, lost around 400 exposures just doing that. Let's look how this, ha this um, affected the FWHM. And you can see that this number of stars is a great criteria to use because it, it basically naturally removed the frames with a bad FWHM, a ba bad full width health measure because you would get, you would detect fewer stars when you have poor tracking, right? So we can still do something like, um, I want to add the condition that the full width has, has measure should be less than six, right? So I'm gonna add that. Let's see whether it impacts anything in terms of the number of frames that are remaining. I currently have 1,169. One more frame was rejected, right? So there's, um, a very, like, the, I think the number of stars really is a great criteria to use overall. And uh, that's what I'm doing with uh, my frames. Let's have a look at the eccentricity. Uh, I'm gonna remove all frames that have over 0 0.7 in eccentricity, just to be, um, to be safe. Maybe even 0 0.65, let's try 0 0.65. So I want to have eccentricity is inferior to 0 0.65, right? Let's validate that. And uh, we'll see how that looks like in a moment. So we were at 1,168. We'll are, we are down to, we've removed another 100 frames or so based on poor ex ex uh, eccentricity. Um, okay, so now I'm left with 1,000 decent frame. So it's it's as if I had thrown a whole night of imaging away, but such is life. And I think it is better to do so than to risk basically including really poor signal to noise ratio frames, especially the ones that are lost in the smog, uh, the smog of war uh, there. Let's uh, go back to my number of stars. Like this is so obviously wrong, right? It's like, you don't want to use those subs because they have a, 
a much less good uh, signal to noise ratio which is what we are after and now I'm going to uh, set a weighting and uh, the weighting is going to be using again I'm going to just use the number of stars as my main weighting criteria uh, but actually I don't really like losing that many stars to eccentricity so I change my criteria for eccentricity to 0 0.7 and then the, the weighting hopefully uh, will take care of that with the number of stars that are left. So uh, the weighting, I'm just going to use number of stars, I'll keep it simple and what I'm going to do is play around with numbers and basically my baseline is I want to uh, take number of stars divided by a star max let's uh, validate that and it's going to compute that throughout uh, the weights so it's actually going to take a little bit of time a few seconds and here we are we have the uh, star weights the weights of each of the exposure that has been set um, obviously we are uh, well we're not going down all the way to uh, zero right because we already rejected the ones with a very low star count uh, but still some of the exposures have very low values right so if I sort uh, by weight um, ascending and I go to the top of that list I should see the frames with the lowest weights and then I can kind of play around until I get like a proper let's say minim minimum weight of maybe around 50 to 60 percent right so um, let's see, uh, yeah, the lowest is 0 0.067, but that frame has been rejected. So um, I can just um, ignore that. Uh, it's good to see that most of the rejected frames anyway would have had a very low weight. And now I'm going to do something stupid, like try like random stuff really, like uh, stars minus 20. You know, I'm not big into looking into the theory or whatever. I'm going to do star max minus 20, kind of like flatten it a little bit, flatten the contrast in a way between the weights of the frame and, uh, and just validate that and see what we get in terms of uh, weights for the, the frames that have been selected but that have the lowest, the lowest weight. I want that weight to be at least 0 0.5 roughly. So uh, it's still processing. And it is, uh, it is done now. Of course, um, for some of the exposures, we'll get negative weights, but the negative weight will be only for things that we have rejected, right? Because they had fewer than 20 stars, which is fine. Um, so let's go scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, and get until we get to some frames that have been approved. And it seems the lowest when I use the value of 20 is uh, 44, uh, 0.44, whereas the highest will be 1. So this is not too bad. I can uh, try to adjust some more. And uh, it just turns out that actually using 15 as a value is not bad. It gives me my worst selected frame error around my weight of 50. So, which is what I want. And I could like use all of those super advanced formulae that are online about using uh, SNR, uh, FWHM, uh, star shape, eccentricity, all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to use the number of stars because that's the criteria that I'm using. It's simpler and I do find that number of stars is pretty inclusive of all of those other criteria. And so what I'm going to do next is just select output subframes which will basically output the exact same images but with uh, the weight here stored in this SS weight uh, keyword. I'm going to select uh, a directory. I'm just going to create something called measured and select that uh, folder and just uh, we're going to export all of those uh, frames. And this again is going to take a few minutes so I'll be back once it is done. See you then. Okay, and now the process is done. We've uh, measured the subframes and we've actually recorded them with the proper uh, weight and the keyword, the SS weight keyword in the FITS file. Now, before I leave this process, I'm actually going to write down that particular file, like 0207 from uh, April 29th there, uh, because it's my file with the highest weight and that's probably what I want to use for as the reference frame when I do both uh, when I do the star integration uh, sorry the star alignment 
And I can actually also, you know, directly from this subframe selector, something that's very convenient, is also while I'm doing all of those operations, I can double click on any of the frames and just look at it. And we can see that, yeah, this is a, a pretty clean looking, looking frame with the galaxy in the middle that's more or less defined, at least for my standards, in a, in a white zone. Um, so this is like uh, the output of the subframe selector. And what I want to do next is the star alignment with this frame as the, um, uh, the reference frame. So we're going to open the star alignment tool from the process explorer. And here it is. And my reference image, I'm actually going to use this as a view directly. That way it's, uh, it's already there and it's easier. Uh, validate. I will not generate drizzle data, by the way, because I don't need um, drizzling data. I don't need to use the drizzle algorithm because I'm properly, properly sampled uh, versus my seeing and, and sky conditions. So I am going to just add my files and my files are from the uh, needle processing measured folder there. So these are all of the files that have been measured and that contain the SS weight keyword with the weight that I want to eventually use in the integration wizard. And uh, here we are and we're going to output that in yet another folder which is going to be, so needle processing, and I'll just call it registered. And hopefully it, come on, come on Windows, you can do this. Or maybe Windows cannot do this. Uh, there it is, uh, we're good. And uh, I'm just gonna leave the settings as they are. Typically it works well for me. If there's any issue, uh, then you know I can always intervene in the middle. And what I'm gonna do is just uh, click the apply global and that should create all of the files that will have been registered based on this view uh, here. So let's click that. It's starting up on eight different threads with my, uh, 10 different threads uh, with my uh, CPU apparently. And, uh, and it will keep going until uh, I, uh, I, until it's done. And so I'll uh, get back to you once it is done. It should take a little bit of time. So see you then. Okay, and the integration is now done. So I can actually go to my needle processing registered, open up any of those uh, files, and we should be able to check that um, the file is aligned with this. And yes, we can see it snaps on perfectly. Uh, we're perfectly aligned. So this is great. Uh, so we have uh, now weighted all that we have calibrated, weighted and registered the frames. Now is the time we've all been waiting for the actual integration of my frames. So I am going to icon all of this, go to the process explore, explorer and go to image integration. And we're going to add the files. If the add file window appears somewhere. There it is. And we want to add the registered files. Here we are, I'm going to select everything, uh, which should be, by the way, slightly fewer frames than we had before, if I remember correctly, 1,100, yep, 1,135 items. We've, uh, we've unfortunately had to throw away so many uh, frames already. And now we want to make sure that we have uh, average, the uh, weights will be a fits key keyword, which will be SS weight. So that's for uh, the weights. And uh, what else? So we have additive with scaling here. We will not even sure what subtract pedestal does, but we don't have a pedestal value, so we should be fine. Uh, we don't need to evaluate the noise. I'm fine without that. Um, we want to do some pixel rejection. I it's basically a matter of uh, being used to that. I use the Windsorized uh, Sigma clipping. I think with my number of frames, actually, uh, the percentile clipping is better, but whatever. And I want to uncheck clip low range. I have no idea why, but that's what I always do and what I read about. And then I'm going to keep my Sigma uh, options the same. And we're going to launch that. Again, it's going to take a bit of time uh, to integrate 1,000 over, over 1,000 frames. But I'll be back once uh, it's over. So it started and see you later. 
Okay, and the integration is finally over. Uh, it took a bit of time, um, as, as always, when you have over a thousand frames. Uh, we get three uh, frames as a result of the integration. The high and low is just showing you what pixels were rejected by the uh, algorithm. And we can see that some pixels, especially like stars that were not properly in focus, have been rejected. Um, reject and low is generally like small, like uh, amounts of noise. Um, not, nothing looks really untowards to me here. And then we have the actual image, which doesn't look too bad at all, actually. Um, so we see the needle galaxy, definitely. We see a companion galaxy there. I have no idea what it is. Uh, but this is the image that I'm going to use to process from. So I think for this particular video, we're going to stop at the pre-processing. And in the next video, I'll look at actually processing this uh, image. So taken from a very light polluted area and see what we can get out of it. So thank you very much for watching. If you have any remarks, comments or advice, <laughs> advice is very well very welcome. Uh, please let me know in the comments. If you like, click like, subscribe and uh, see you next time. Thank you.